to the next couple of hours, becoming unstuck with neuro change. And very, very pleased um, to have Scott and Laura and Rhonda in from the neuro change team. This is the first piece of work that we've done together. Um, really pleased um, to be here for the next couple of hours and all the great and exciting content that you've been developing in your team. And we're going to get a little taster, a snapshot of that to, of that today. So before I pass over to you, Rhonda, I'll do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so, but I wanted to say hello first of all um, to morning. the three of you. Good morning, and a big everybody. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Rhonda. Thank Lovely. You. So what to say? Well, we're going to be here on Zoom for a couple of hours together. So you'll hear a little bit of my Scottish accent. We're going to, we're going to be in Zoom for a couple of hours. Um, we're recording the workshop too, so that we'll, we're going to be able to share some of that content later as well. And I just want to kind of um, reassure everybody, we're not recording the whole group here. We, the Zoom system just records whoever is unmuted and speaking. So right now that's going to be me. Um, and for most of the time, that's going to be the team that's presenting to us. The only difference to that is if you do unmute and make a comment or ask a question, you will automatically be included in the recording. Um, and you might be very thrilled to be on the recording uh, with the NeuroChange team. And if, if it's important for you not to be on the recording, please just email us at online events and we can edit you out. That's no problem. So we don't want that to get in the way of your interaction in the workshop. And of course, we're going to be using the chat room a lot for interaction, for feedback, for questions. So it's lovely that we're all saying hello and introducing ourselves there. And let's, um, we can keep doing that as we go out, go throughout the two hours of the workshop. We've also got Sebastian here, a very well-known face to many of us, taking care of the technology. So Sebastian, thank you for taking care of us and making sure everything is working well. Um, if anybody does have any technology difficulties, please let Sebastian know. You can use the chat room for that. There's an email address, there's a phone number, so plenty of ways to get support from the um, online events team. Um, we are using breakout rooms, so we've got a couple of breakout rooms as we go through the workshop to really deepen the experience and um, yeah, it's just really nice to be in a group of maybe three or four other colleagues doing an exercise um, to really embed that learning in us. We also appreciate that not everybody can be participating in breakout rooms. So if that's you, please you can, uh, let us know by either using in your Zoom name NBR for no breakout room. That's a good way to let Sebastian know that you can't be in the small group or let us know in the chat room as well. So um, that's also a good way to let Sebastian know. So some colleagues will stay here and other colleagues will be in those small groups. Um, but we'll all have a chance to reflect on the questions and the exercises. We're also going out live on the social. So that is a new function that we've got here on, on um, online events. So if you are joining us on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn, a warm welcome to you too. You won't be able to participate in breakout rooms out there, of course, you'll need to come into Zoom. So if you would like to come and do that small group work with us, the registration link is on the live feed. Just click on that, get yourself registered for the workshop, come into Zoom, and Sebastian will include you in that small group work as well. If you're out on the socials, you'll still also be able to listen to the presentation. You'll be able to send some questions through the chat. I'll be able to pick that up for the team. Um, but of course, if you do want to make contact um, around this content, please register and we will be in touch with more information about how you can um, get more of the good stuff that we're going to get a bit of a taster on today. And the final thing to say about the technology, we've also, it's been a, well, it's been a real week all over the world, but in terms of technology in Zoom, we've added in that possibility to live stream out um, the presenters and also we've got translated captions here in Zoom now too. So we've got captions to support you along with the audio. If you'd like to have some text um, to support your listening, 
And they are now also being translated into, I think it's nine different languages, which is pretty amazing. The thing is, that it's a computer that's doing all that stuff. So it's not 100% accurate. This is just the third event that we've been using this feature in. So if you're coming in and English is not your first language and you would like to test out that function, or maybe you do have another language that you speak alongside English, you'd like to test that and give us some feedback in the chat room. We'd love to know, like, is it um, is the computer completely confused by my Swiss accent? That's probably a guaranteed yes. <laughs> it tries to translate or, you know, are, are those captions kind of useful? Um, if you want to give us some feedback, we'd really welcome that. So good. I think that's all my ramblings about intros and housekeeping. So it's my privilege to welcome the team, first of all, by reading their bios. I think that's going to give you a sense of the gravitas that is coming to the workshop, the real experience, um, and of course, the passion for this topic as well. Um, so let me do that, and then I'll pass over to Rhonda to get started. So um, the first bio I'm going to read is Professor Scott Frey. Professor Scott Frey is the Miller Family Professor of Cognitive um, Neuroscience at the University of Missouri, where he directs the Rehabilitation Neuroscience Laboratory. Professor Frey received his Master's of Education from Harvard University in Human Development and his PhD in Experimental Psychology from Cornell University. Early in his career, he pursued additional training in brain imaging and neurostimulation at Dartmouth College's Center for Cognitive Neuroscience. We also have with us Laura Delang, who is our Institute Director and is central to the instructional design of our programs. More than that, Laura brings high level input to program creation and an extreme level of wisdom to all we do at the NeuroChange Institute. After completing her degree in education, Laura was invited to complete her master's in philosophy and accepted this on the condition that her focus will be on teaching children philosophy. And Rhonda Kerlou. So Rhonda, it's lovely to be introducing you. you we've been working hard, haven't we, over the last weeks to <laughs> um, cook this event, get it ready. So it's a really lovely to introduce you. So Rhonda Kerlou is one of the NeuroChange Institute's national directors, providing program access to practitioners and professionals globally. Rhonda has had a diverse career as a registered nurse specialising in cardiac care and cardiac arrhythmias. She's moved on to learn and grow with Johnson & Johnson, where she progressed to leading the arrhythmia division in Canada. After completing her executive MBA with Ivy, Toronto, Canada, it became imperative for Rhonda to continue a path of exploration of her own potential as an independent consultant and leader supporting large healthcare organizations. Rhonda is now fulfilling her purpose, supporting practitioners to thrive personally and professionally with the support of the NeuroChange program. Further, she will be accepting an honorary doctorate in business and is moving to global directorship with the NeuroChange Institute. And that's just happened this weekend, Rhonda. You've received your yes. honorary doctorate. So I should really be addressing you as Dr. Rhonda. I think that would be <laughs> only appropriate. Yes. It's okay. <laughs> so a warm welcome, Rhonda, and over to you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, yes, all of that happened this weekend. So it's been uh, it's been a whirlwind. And you know, having all of you here today is fantastic. And uh, John, I'm going to get you to put up the first slide. Um, yeah, just and take a moment. To keep, there it is. Come yeah, on. fantastic. That way I'm just not looking at myself in a big image on the screen. Um, so today is going to be a little bit of an adventure. Uh, John and I met oh, months ago. Uh, he had reached out because he saw some information that I had posted about the neural change method. And so today, what we're going to do is we're going to give you a taste of what this is all about. And at the very end of the presentation, um, we have some tools. Uh, we have a resource for you, actually, that you'll be able to take back um, and use in your practice. That'll be at the very end. And just prior to 
to that. I'm going to give you a summary of what the neural change method is all about. But with my team, uh, Professor Scott Fry and Laura DeLange, what we want to do is, is introduce the whole concept of the neural change method to you, give you some experiential um, experience today using some of the 50 some odd tools and activities that are in the program. So we want to make sure that you have a great uh, experience today. And um, yeah, enjoy if you can, if you can get into the breakout group, the breakout groups today, it, it will help to um, anchor this experience, but we absolutely understand uh, that you can't. So without any further ado, let's, um, Let's get into it. So can we have the next slide, please, Sebastian? So I thought this was kind of funny um, because today we're gonna to talk about neural change, which has a transformational component and that's in the practitioner level. But then we have a second level, which is um, a master practitioner level. And this includes transcendence. And when I say the word transcendence, you know, I know sometimes that can be off-putting, but, and I'm not speaking about kind of the levitating Buddha that we have in our mind. We're talking about the neuroscience of, of, we're talking about the neuroscience of transcendence. So we'll get into that and bring clarity around that def definition so that we're all on the same page. Can you go to the next slide, please? I love this joke anyway. Right. So this is about expanding your toolkit. This is about um, helping you get unstuck. And I want to go back to John and I chatting. So we had no idea how we were both on each other's calendar. It was a very strange event. Um, and then we had a great conversation about the work that the Neural Change Institute is going on at the Neural Change Institute and, you know, Laura Delaying and Scott. Professor Scott Fryer to the individuals who definitely contribute to the content and the delivery. Um, I'm the global director uh, with the Neural Change Institute. So I'm building a team of, of, of executives, but also um, my role is to talk to people globally about this particular program. And, you know, our, our community is is quite diverse you know we have people from 12 countries now that's probably above that um also um we also have a cross-section of uh licensed psychologists um we have counselors therapists we have uh some teachers uh nurse practitioners uh, um, also a lot of physicians um, looking to make to support their their patients or clients to make long-term change. So it's quite the community of practice. And I'll get into more of that later. Um, but I just wanted you to know somewhere in the community, there's probably someone working like yourself. Um, so, you know, you should feel that, you know, this is not above your work or, um, you know, so, so I think there's, there's something for, for everyone uh, who's supporting patients or clients to make change long-term. And that's kind of what I want you to, to think about as we uh, go through this, uh, this day. All right. Next slide, please. So this is just everything that John said. So we can go to the next slide and why we're here today, which I explained um, to introduce you to, excuse me, it's allergy season. <coughs> excuse me, it's allergy season here in Canada, so I may have a few sneezes. Um, why we're here today again is to share the knowledge, is to introduce you to some new methodologies that you can take to your practice. And we wanna ensure that we give you some tools that you can use today. Um, you know. One of the things that John Wilson brought up to me was um, something I had heard from hundreds of practitioners around the world, and that's being stuck, either being stuck with a particular client or patient or, or a group, um, and also being stuck themselves, um, not to mention isolation and, and some of the other things, but 
the the stuckness that that was the thing that um, I took back to my team and said, you know, this is a common thread. And I talk to you know a dozen people a day, so and I keep hearing this 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 common thread. So this is what we're going to address today: how to get unstuck. And you know, you may think that you've moved forward with a particular individual and you know those ruminations come back and you, and you swear you've solved it so this is this is really to support you with with that stuckness but also it's going to be pretty relevant to some of the other work that you're doing um so i'm going to move forward now i don't want to stick on that so go ahead john or sebastian Thank you. And so Laura is going to um, move forward now and she's going to talk about this stuckness and she's going to um, actually, excuse me, it's uh, Professor Scott Fry who's going to talk about the neural change and what we mean by neural change. And we're, we're playing with that, that in two ways. Neural change is the name of the program, but neural change is also changing our brains. So uh, Laura, if you want to get into stuckness in the way that you've explained it. I, I love it. I wanted you to share it with the group and then we'll move it over to Scott. Sound good? Sounds good. Um, yeah, I don't really have much more to add on stuckness than Rhonda covered, but I think stuckness is such a normal part of what we do um, when we're working as practitioners uh, and it's something that we need to embrace, but still need tools to be able to, to deal with. So I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page about stuckness, right? So it's um, the, the word that people love using is um, resistance. And resistance is a great word as long as, as we're not using it as, it as an excuse as a practitioner. So we're going to get into what the brain is doing. Scott is going to chat to us about what the brain is doing and that this resistance is, is part of the normal brain function. Um, but because it's part of the normal brain function, we have the tools to deal with it. So Scott, over to you. Well, good, good morning, afternoon, evening. It's very early morning here in Colorado, uh, but it, I'm absolutely thrilled to have the opportunity to talk with you all today. I'm just going to adjust things here so I can see you because it wants to just show me myself and no one should be forced to just look at themselves, right, for, for long periods of time. Um, so I would take the next slide, please. So I'm charged with telling you a bit about the NeuroChange program, but as Rhonda noted, NeuroChange is both the name of the program and, uh, and it really reflects the science that we build the program from. And I'm gonna focus on that science now. And I think that's what's really at the heart of this program. Uh, it is an attempt to draw on uh, evidence from neuroscience and psychology to really ground uh, what we're doing here. And I think you'll get a good flavor for that this morning. Uh, I'm going to begin by telling you some of what I know about uh, how the brain changes and how it changes in ways that support our behaviors and how we can begin to think about leveraging the neuroplasticity, if you will, of the brain to get unstuck. And uh, that will lead, I hope, very naturally to uh, Laura's discussion as, as uh, we move forward into some practical ways of doing that. <clears throat> so I take the next slide, please. I like this pithy quote, the mind is what the brain does. And that's really at the heart of uh, what we're talking about when we talk about neurochange here. When I'm, this is a quote that, uh, uh, is uh, credited to Marvin Minsky, who some of you may know that name. Marvin Minsky is really the father of artificial intelligence. Back in MIT in the 1960s, uh, I had a pleasure uh, in the 1990s of getting to, to uh, spend some time with Marvin Minsky in the context of a seminar. 
And that seminar is really devoted to talking about the mind. What is the mind? Well, when I'm talking about the mind from the perspective of a cognitive neuroscientist, I'm talking about the entire collection of your perceptions, your emotions, your thoughts, your beliefs, your memories, and even your sense of self. So it's all those mental activities uh, that take place uh, within uh, the context of your daily life, living as a human. Uh, these, uh, the majority of these functions, interestingly enough, um, don't happen within our awareness. And yet, and this is a very important point, these non-conscious or subconscious aspects of mental function can really exert very powerful effects on our behavior. And I wanna just give you a simple little example of what I mean when I'm talking about non-conscious functions. Uh, why don't you all wiggle your nose for me? And if you can't wiggle your nose, why don't you just wiggle your fingers, right? I'm not so good at wiggling my nose, but here I'll embarrass myself in order to, to put you at ease. How'd you do that? How'd you wiggle your nose or wiggle your fingers? How did you go from the idea that you wanted to do that to actually doing that? It's very tough, isn't it, to describe? And the reason it's tough to describe is that the processes that give rise to that action in the world, that translation of an idea into action, are really happening outside of our awareness. It's an incredibly simplistic kind of example, but this is exactly the kind of thing that's going on all the time. Our behavior is not only a function of our conscious mental activities, but it is profoundly influenced by what's going on outside of our awareness. And one of the key things here at the NeuroChange uh, Institute is that uh, we have exercises that have been designed and developed to help to reveal some of those non-conscious sources of motivation and so forth that, that influence our behavior. And uh, we may have time to get into that a little more as we go on, but I'm going to I'm going to proceed now with the next slide, please. To take this this idea of the mind being what the brain does a little bit further. What I mean when I'm talking about this is that all of those conscious and non-conscious thoughts, ideas, beliefs, and so forth as well as our physical behaviors, our actions, right? Uh, taking notes when you're listening to this talk, dialing the telephone, having a conversation, these all arise from distinct patterns of activity in neural circuits within the brain. Your thoughts and your actions are products of activity within this two to three pound organ. And each of those uh, thoughts and each of those activities really reflects a unique brain state. When we develop a habit, a habit of thought, a habit of action, that's really a reflection of activity within these specific neural circuits that have been incrementally strengthened over time to support that behavior. And uh, as, as fellow psychologists and behaviorists, you, you can uh, see where this is going. We're talking about learning here. We're talking about the neural basis of experience dependent change within the brain. And the connection between that and behavior is really profound. <clears throat> we uh, develop habits and exercise habits repeatedly and in doing so, we're actually modifying the brain circuits that support those habits. And I want to unpack that idea a little bit more because that's really fundamental to what we're talking about when we talk about neurochange. May I have the next slide, please? Let's talk a little bit about the physiology. So this pithy little quote here, uh, neurons that fire together, wire together, is uh, fundamental to understanding how the brain changes to support habits uh, and, as well as modifications in habits. And that really is key to not only the neurochange program, but also to harnessing the power to change 
right, to change circuitry to support new habits and modified behaviors or to get unstuck. I'd like the next slide, please. When you repeat a thought or action, as I was mentioning a moment ago, the circuits in your brain that are responsible for producing that thought or that action are strengthened. That's really what we mean by when, when we say neurons that fire together, wire together. The more that those circuits are exercised, the stronger they get. We have strengthening occurring at the level of the synapses where the neurons are communicating action potentials with one another. Uh, we have a variety of changes in the myelin sheaths that uh, help with the conduction of those action potentials, in the number of synapses, in the strength of synapses, and so forth. There are true physiological and anatomical changes that are happening in these circuits by virtue of exercising them. And it's important to think about uh, the repetition of a behavior is not only uh, strengthening existing connections, but also potentially form forming new ones. I like this metaphor of uh, a forest, right? So I've got a beautiful picture here of a forest and you don't see any clear way to make your way through this forest, right? When you start walking from one location to another in this forest, you're gonna be bushwhacking and you're gonna be tripping over rocks and sticks and making your way around trees and, and bushes and so forth. But if you were to continue to walk that path repeatedly, what would happen? Well, what would happen is that gradually through repeated traversing of that, that, uh, that tract through the forest, you would begin to wear a path into the earth you would begin to uh, clear away the sticks that are in the way. You would begin to smoothen the ground with the trampling uh, of your feet. You would etch a path through that forest that would make it much easier for you as time went on to move from that location to another location, simply by walking that path. And I think that's a wonderful metaphor for what's happening in your brain when you repeat a behavior. And by behavior, again, I wanna stress, I'm talking about a thought, right? A mental behavior, a mental act, or a physical act, both of which have their origins in the neural circuitry of your brain. So as we repeat a behavior, analogous to what happens when we walk a path in the forest, the path gets easier to traverse. You can move more quickly, and more sure-footedly along that path with time. And that's exactly what happens when we're forming a habit. The more we repeat that habit of thought or that habit of action, the easier it becomes to move through that particular path because the circuitry of your brain, like the floor of that forest, is literally modified by the repetition of that behavior. Now there's a flip side to this as well, and you may already be intuiting it. If we stop repeating that behavior, if we stop walking that path through the forest, the opposite begins to happen, right? If I uh, had moved through this forest and created this wonderful path over time, and then I went away for a while, maybe I took the summer and I went, uh, I went to Snowdonia, right? Wonderful place to, to spend the summer. And I came back to my, my forest in Colorado, my path might be very hard to discern. Plants would have grown up, sticks would have fallen, leaves would have covered it up and so forth. That's exactly what happens in your brain to the neural circuits when we stop exercising them. The flip side of neurons that fire together, wire together, is that not repeating thoughts or actions actually weakens these circuits. Like that path on the forest floor, once you stop walking it, once you stop repeating those thoughts or actions, nature begins to take over and it starts to disappear. 
you can think of it as approaching a state of entropy. Now, an important point to make here is that neuroplasticity, the changes we're talking about here through the repetition of a, uh, of, of a behavior, either a mental behavior or a physical behavior, is generally considered to be something that's incremental. And wonderfully enough, my research and the research of many other people uh, is pointing to the fact that this is not something that's just limited to a certain portion of our lifespan, but really seems to be a potential that exists within all of us throughout the lifespan. In my own research, I've worked with people who've had profound injuries to the brain or to the body, and we've really looked at the kind of changes that took place as these people work to recover functions. And what's been really astonishing is, is that, that that potential to, to harness the power of neuroplasticity continues throughout the life. So you're never too old for change. I wanna make a point here, and uh, this will be developed a little further when Laura begins to talk to you uh, more, but we're coming to appreciate that, uh, well, neuroplasticity, as I've been describing it, and as we traditionally thought about it, is this kind of gradual incremental thing, we're starting to realize that they're also tipping points. Where change can be linear and gradual in your nervous system up until a point, and then you flip into another state. That kind of tipping point turns out to be really essential for some of the new work that we're beginning to develop here at NeuroChange on the topic of transcendence, where people experience change that feels very abrupt, right? That doesn't feel like it's a slow, gradual, incremental thing, as most change is. This is a very new area for neuroscience and for psychology as well. Um, but in the spirit of what we're trying to do here at the Institute, we're constantly trying to incorporate the newest science into our programs. And because science is dynamic and changing, so are our programs. And Laura will get into that a bit more when she talks to you in a moment. May I have the next slide, please? So this is just uh, to carry on the metaphor a little bit. This is our forest that reflects a well-trodden path. And that's very much like the situation we're all in because we all have our own unique habits and we've all sculpted our brain by repeating particular thoughts and actions. And we all have our own path through the forest. But unfortunately, these paths don't always serve us well. And unfortunately, when we, when we try to use the same path to solve all of the challenges that we might have in navigating our way through the forest of life, uh, we can find ourselves stuck. Next slide, please. So the key thing is here, uh, as, as Rhonda pointed out at the beginning, we wanna spend time together today talking about how to get unstuck. And I think uh, we can continue along with the forest metaphor here, right? Changing a habit of thought or of action begins with making a choice. There's a wealth of, of research in psychology about how do we begin to modify a habit of thought? How do we begin to mo modify a habit of behavior? And it really begins with making a choice. Do we take the path to the left? Do we take the path to the right? The critical thing here from my perspective as a neuroscientist is that each time we implement this modified thought or action, this new choice, right? Or each time we choose not to repeat the old pattern, maybe the old habit was always to go to the right. And today we decide that that path 
is not the most direct one to, to the goals and purposes in our life that we'd like to achieve. And we make a deliberate choice to try going to the left. Each time we make that choice to go to the left, we're harnessing neuroplasticity because what your brain is going to do is respond adaptively. And that's what's really wonderful about this. When you implement a modified thought or action, when you change and go to the left instead of the right, you're going to stimulate a modified neural circuit to su that supports the implementation of that new thought or action or modified habit. And the more you do that, the more you take the path to the left, the easier that path is gonna to become to walk, the smoother it's going to be, the quicker you're gonna be able to get, uh, to, to take and traverse that new trajectory through the woods. It's just like forming a new path, but it's really a modification of an old path. Next slide, please. So critical point that I'd like you to really reflect on as we spend time together today and, and hopefully afterward is that when we make a choice to do something differently, when we choose to implement a new thought or action or a modification of, of an existing habit that we have, these choices are going to perpetuate incremental changes in the brain that support that new or modified habit. And the more you repeat that, the easier it's going to be. That forest path, that new modified path is going to unfold in front of you in a way that makes that new or modified behavior easier and easier. And what's gonna to happen to that old behavior, the one we're, we're changing away from? Well, that path is going to get harder and harder to follow. Roots, plants are gonna begin springing up, sticks are gonna fall in there, leaves are gonna come down, right? The more we use the path, the easier it gets to use that path. The more it becomes our new habit, the more it becomes automatic. The more we've taken advantage of our own biology, neurons that fire together, wire together. And neurons that uh, fire together and wire together are there to support your new behaviors. And that's the wonderful thing about this brain is that we have the ability, and we're doing it all the time, you're all professionals at this, of sculpting our no neural circuitry. And again, I wanna say that, you know, as, as we're thinking about this, I've really spoken of this uh, walking the path metaphor, and that really is a wonderful metaphor, I think, for gradual incremental change. We're also beginning to understand that our nervous system is capable at some point along that incremental linear change process of on certain occasions reaching a kind of tipping point where we really have a switch, right? And we switch from one brain state to another in a way that is best captured, I think, by this word transcendence which harkens back to Rhonda's earlier uh, cartoon, which I think we all got a good smile out of, and which uh, serves as, as kind of a press a for what uh, Laura is gonna be talking about. So this all sounds very easy, right? And if it was as easy as it sounds, we probably wouldn't need to be here today because we'd all be able to immediately change from uh, a habit to a modified habit to a new habit at, as, uh, as these help us best to uh, approach our purpose and goals in life. But of course it isn't that easy, right? Um, your brain's there to support you and will respond to uh, your, your modifications of thoughts and actions. But the big question is how? And that's where I'm going to hand things off 
to my, my colleague who has the expertise to really uh, answer that question or address that question uh, and how we do that within the NeuroChange program. Laura, thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, great, can we have the next slide? So I think this slide, <laughs> just a beautiful summation of uh, Scott's whole talk. Um, and it's important to realize that this neuroplasticity gives us all this gift, right? That there's no, there's no time that is too late. You can always change whatever you want to change about your brain, um, which is a really powerful thought, I think. So on the next slide, we can see how we try to approach it in the NeuroChange Institute. So there are a lot of activities included in our uh, NeuroChange practitioner course that are focused around this incremental change and trying to get meaningful transformation to clients. And it's been a lot of fun working with the subject matter experts and looking at all of the research and trying to get the best methods for bringing incremental change to clients, whether that's uh, ranging from deliberate practice to implementation intentions and even leveraging subconscious motivations and, and mechanisms. So that's a lot of good stuff in there. But uh, even at a very simple level, I wanted to just highlight a bit, a part of one of the activities uh, from the course which shows how this kind of incremental iterative process of choosing to walk down a path every day can get you slowly, slowly, slowly get you to this point where, yes, you've made a change and yes, you've become unstuck. So in this activity, very simply starts with picking something that you'd like to change. And maybe using Scott's language, this would be a behavior, but a behavior in the broadest sense, right? So a thought, a feeling, a belief, or something that, that translates into action into the world. So let's go with, um, I believe I'm not an organized person and that's something I would like to change about myself. So then we go into a brainstorm and deciding what, are the things that an organized person does every day and writing them all down. Once you've got this list of what an organized person does, then you can start with the neuroplasticity. So you pick the smallest and easiest one and you do it every day. And you tick off each day to make sure that you've done it. Then the next week you pick another habit and you do it every day and you tick it off, et cetera, et cetera. And this activity then has a reflection element and trying to reflect on how that changing the behavior, how does that change the mind and how does that change the brain? So we know that it changes the brain because we know that each behavior is just a neural pathway. So as we change the behavior, we are slowly, slowly, slowly changing the mental pathway. But we also know that the feelings and the mind, so I liked Scott's distinction of this mind, because I think as practitioners, that's the level that we're working on, right? We're trying to engage with other people's minds and help them to change their minds. So change the subjective feelings and thoughts and patterns in, in the mind. And by changing the behavior, and changing the brain, this mind element seems to also be changed. So on the next slide, you will see that it is now time for a breakout room. So the breakout rooms have two purposes. The first is just to create a place to pause. So it's a space for you to reflect and think about um, what's going to happen. And then it's a time for you to have interesting, meaningful conversations with your peers, trying to implement some of the ideas that we've spoken about today. So on the next slide, you'll see first breakout room is going to be dealing with a kind of client case study. So 
I think the story of Natalie is the perfect example of a client being stuck. So Natalie is this super successful nurse. She's comfortable working with the patients. She's happily married. She has close friends. But she has this irrational extreme anxiety that she feels around other people because she's six foot three inches tall. And she feels that as a woman that is way too tall and everyone will think that she is a freak. So she can't shake this anxiety that she feels around colleagues and in large groups of people. And Natalie has tried some therapeutic avenues before. And she says her last therapist taught her relaxation exercises, how to talk back to negative thoughts, encouraged her to start experimenting with small group socialization. But none of that seems to work because the anxiety just hijacks her brain. So on the next slide, you'll see that I want you to kind of work with Natalie's case study. So how can you use this brain body action feedback loop to implement incremental change for Natalie? So this question has two aspects. The first is trying to identify how the brain is affecting the mind, is affecting her actions in the world. And once you've kind of figured out what that feedback loop is doing, how would you implement incremental change to slowly, slowly, slowly start changing those neural pathways to help net? So Sebastian is going to create some breakout rooms for us. So these should be nice and small. I know I'm not going to tell you how to run your breakout room because you're all experienced professionals, but we're going to have around 15 minutes. So a nice strategy might be to um, spend a little bit of time introducing yourself to your partners, spend two or three minutes giving your initial thoughts on this topic, and then you can see how the discussion develops from there. Cool. Sebastian, are we ready? I think we're just about ready to go. Okay. And, and Sebastian, I guess once we get in, you could show that slide for another couple of minutes into the breakout yes. room so everybody has got a view of the slide. Lovely. Thank you, Sebastian. Good. Okay. Over to you. Three minutes. Opening rooms in three, two, one. 